What were the fun sites you checked out? And especially, did you enjoy the Brooklyn food? Oh, I love the food. Love, love the food. I love, honestly, my favorite thing was hitting the little bodegas because, hey. oh, yeah, we don't have those here. It's that time again. Oh, it's that good time again to get real with your guy, Ronald E. Smith. And my guest today is a man of many talents. And while he's a good man with a great arm, the only thing I can find a good complaint about him is his favorite teams in football. Oh. And we'll get into that because I'm already disgusted about that. <laughs> the only person I could be talking about is Met Farm player, member and player of the Bigmington Rumble Ponies. The guy I'm talking with is Tony Debrell. How you doing, my man? I'm doing good. I can't complain, man. I'm glad to be here. Glad for uh, you having me on. And let's just get straight to the point, because this is what everyone's been asking you to, since the get-go. Why in the world are you a Cowboys fan? Like, what, what, oh. what, 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 what is this? What is going on with that? Where did that come from? You know, there's really not a lot behind it. My father, he's from uh, San Antonio. And so growing up, the only team I watched was the Dallas Cowboys, because he was watching them. So I kind of just fell in love with them. And then, you know, once you get that in your blood, you can't, you can't put them down. So I just, even, no matter what. Even with all their ups and downs and mostly headaches, you hey, still rock with them to the end? Hey, I'm a fan. I, and I believe next year we'll win the Super Bowl. But that's just my belief. That's oh, how I feel. Full statement right there. <laughs> that's so, how I feel. So then you, then you got to tell me, well, who are your all-time favorite Cowboy, Cowboy fa players? Oh, I loved Emmitt Smith growing up. Um, read his book, everything. I just love the way he played and like how he would say he saw the play before it happened. That always just stuck with me. So I loved Emmett Smith. Um, Michael Irving, honestly, his energy hey. is just different. So you can't really hate the guy. And then uh, this one might sound kind of crazy, but uh, I honestly rock with Tony Romo. I really liked him. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> you know, it, it, that was kind of cool. Tony gets so much like mixed, mixed love, right? You know, as a player, but then more people love him as a commentator now. He's an incredible commentator. He can see the game before it happens. So he calls the play and then they run that exact play, throw it to that exact exactly. receiver. It's pretty really crazy. But yeah, no, he's my guy. I mean, he was leading us uh, a ton of comeback wins on his shoulders. So I really like uh, Tony Romo. You know, I, I wish I could just save you and put you on a team that will save your life and leave you with less stress. Well, you know, come just, just okay. come just come over. I mean, I, I mean, granted, right now the Patriots ain't what they are right now. Oh no! Uh, look, look. Patriots fan. Look, oh, look, no. look, look. All right, you don't get it, man. Look, they were, they were, were where they were, but right now they're taking a break. You don't think that was just because of Tom Brady? I, I, I believe it was both parties. Both Tom and Belichick made it together. You know, two, two great things can make something even better. All this did was just solidify that he is one of the best quarterbacks of a generation, all time. Like that, that that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> okay, he's I, in my eyes, he's 100% the GOAT. He's got the most championships. That he does. He's got all the records. That he and does. He's still playing. He beat the next the next generational talent in quarterbacks and Patrick Mahomes. He beat that man when he was 43 years old. Which a, is, a lot of people his age are supposed to decrease. Exactly. Yet he is still on a level, which that amazed me 10 times more of it. But I know a lot of people, a lot of head, a lot of football heads will go, well, what about Joe Montana? Mm -hmm. What about Dan Marino? What right. about Peyton? You know? Mm -hmm. And that's a conversation where you got to sit down and really just look at all of them together without thinking about accolades. But I'll always rock. I will always rock with Tom Brady. You yeah. Know, go, go in to the end of the beyond. For sure. Go. With you, Tony, man, for your career, for yourself, as just being a Cowboy fan, uh, I don't know about that, but... Yeah. You growing up, you played more than one sport than just baseball. For sure. So what for you was the real click to make you solidify and say, I want to commit to baseball? So growing up, my parents really just threw me in everything because they didn't know what I liked and they wanted me to find something that I liked. So I did gymnastics, soccer, basketball, football, baseball. I did everything. Just And what happened was in high school, I, I was playing quarterback and the coach wanted me to, you know, be in there watching film every single morning. But during baseball season, that's when we did weights. So I couldn't be there. And then the coach kind of put it in my hands. He was like, if you want to play quarterback, you got to be here. And so 
at that point, I was way better at baseball. So I just chose baseball over that and don't regret it one bit. Were there any people who helped you during that time with your progression as a baseball player to help you grow in your skills? Uh, my dad was at every single one of my games, the thousands of games I played. He's been at all of them. And then um, I think the person who really like started my upper level career and like the knowledge of the game was probably my high school coach, Tim Lemons. Um, he basically opened uh, my high school and he was the coach there and everything that he taught me when I was in high school is the same exact thing that the coaches now are telling me. So he's really the one who um, gave me a lot of the, the little things about the game that you just wouldn't know unless you played. Go through the, the, those years for you in, in high school during those, those times when you're trying to progress and grow yourself. Talk mm -hmm. about those days where from the good starts, but also the bad starts where, you know, the, those bad games can sometimes outshine the good ones that you had for yourself. 100%. Uh, me personally, I'm a big smack talker. So we, before every game, I'd be in the lunchroom calling out what my stats would be, this and that. And all my buddies, they really, uh, if I had a bad game, they would let me know about it. Like till this day. They wouldn't be shy about it. No, they still let me know. And, uh, <laughs> but I think honestly, that probably helped me just because at the end of the day, I know it's just a game and you're not going to win every single time. So it wasn't too hard for me to really rebound. But that was also because I've played so many games. And so I kind of know how it goes. And that's the thing, because, you know, th th those moments, man, like you can't allow it to stay in your head because right. all you're going to be thinking is about, oh, I I'm afraid I'm to throw this pitch again. I'm afraid to throw th this pitch again. But also, too, like you just said before, it's good to have those people. It's good to have those good people to, to keep you in check. And also, too, to make you like, hey, look, man, it's, just, it's still a game. Right. You know, th right. Don't, don't forget that. Right. And uh, thankfully, I had those people in my corner. So. so through all that process for yourself and then when it's time to graduate, you went on draft in, 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 20, in, in 2014. Mm -hmm. What was your mindset at? How were you feeling during that moment? I was like very content with just going to college to play and then that just kind of being the end of my playing days really. Um, Cause I mean, I think I had like one scout contact me and it was just kind of someone who I already known. So I really had one scout. I really didn't, wasn't getting any attention from major league teams. Um, from college, I wasn't really getting that much attention. So I figured, you know, I just go to Kennesaw, do the best I can do, and that'll probably be the end for me. So in your head, you thought that, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go any further than this. Right. Did you, at that time, did you have a backup plan? Like anything in your, in your head, you're like, well, I guess I might get prepared to do this thing. So my mom, both my parents are big on getting my education. So it was, you, you're not playing if you don't get the grades. And so I knew before I even, graduated high school that I was going to graduate college because that's just what my family was expecting of me. So I already knew I was going to do that. And what I wanted to do was um, get a communications degree and then try to go the route of like being a sports analyst and breaking down the games and things of that sort. What about that interest you? Uh, well, one, I love watching the game and I love just getting to like the little intricate details about everything like that. Um, I love to argue all the time. Yeah. So I feel like that's something that really plays for me. And also I'm very personable. So I think I'd be able to, you know, talk to the players and get inside info. And since I played the game, at least I know a little bit more than someone else who hasn't played the game. So that's really what interests me. Just wanted to stay around the game. You know what I mean? So then when you, then when you were able to go to uh, Kansas State University, now what was th that experience for you when something else was able to click for you? So as soon as the Friday night starter pitch and I was like, oh, I am not, I'm not, I'm not that good. And so after, you know, the first fall, I was like, oh, for sure solidified. Like, I'm not that good. Um, I'm probably not going to get drafted. So I'm just going to, you know, stick with it while I'm in college. And then that'll be then. But then my sophomore year came around and I really started working with the pitching coach, uh, Kevin Arminio. And he really just saw it in me that there was something there. And um, basically what when it clicked was we had a little spring uh, world series inner squad and I did really well. There's like six, seven scouts there. They saw me after the game. Uh, our head coach Sanson calls me and he's like, Hey, you're going to go play in the Cape, which is like the best uh, collegiate summer league. And he was like, they want you in the Cape. And that was the first little moment where I thought, Oh, maybe there's something more to this, you know, finishing out in college and you know in your head and your heart you're thinking there might be there might be a chance at this you know right. I, 
I might be, I mean, make something out of this, right? You right. know, but the, any doubt creeping your head of the past of thinking, oh, I once thought this way before, and it fell flat. Will yeah. this be different? One hundred percent. My whole sophomore year, really, I kind of felt like that. I was like, because I still had like a shaky season, so I was like, you know, maybe this and that. I don't know, like. I don't know if it is, but I feel comfortable about it. But then when I went to the Cape and I had a very good season, that's when all that doubt kind of went away. So now as we fast forward, mm -hmm. you, you played so well, you progressed so well to now to the point now, you're, you, you, you're now getting the chance to be drafted. So just before, before draft day, what, what, what were you feeling through this? And also too, were people trying to treat you different thinking that you big time now? Um, no, nah, I mean, it, like my close friends, they, they did not treat me any different, really. It was just, you know, like people that weren't really my friends that try to come around, like those people kind of, yeah. Around, and then like, yeah, but that's with everything. Um, but no, everyone really, everyone acted the same. Uh, I didn't think I was too big time. Um, but before draft day, so I was talking with my agent and for the most part, you kind I kind of already knew where I was going to get drafted, like around what, what round I was going to get drafted. So really it was just waiting for that moment to actually hear my name. It wasn't really anything else, but a little bit anxious, you know. You able to reflect to that moment that you, that you got drafted by the Mets, but also to thinking back like, man, I only got one person that would look at me one time. I didn't think I could do this. Now, fast forward, I'm drafted. All the time. I still think about it because I lit so the Friday night starter was his name's Travis Bergen. I just threw live with him yesterday. And I literally told him the story. I was like, when I got to school, I saw you pitch and I was like, there's no way I can do that. And then now coming up to being drafted higher than he was, you know what I mean? And it's just like that is just it it almost blows my mind how far I came in just three, three years at Kennesaw. So I think about that all the time. What was your family feeling for you through 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 that moment of celebration for you? I feel like they were just so excited and they just showed me a lot of love and support because they knew how hard that I've been working. Like every summer I was playing baseball, never went on spring break, never did any of that. So I just worked so hard for it. And I think for them to see it finally pay off for me, it was just, uh, it's kind of everything for me, for them to be there. And, and just right there, you, you, you talk about sacrifices. Yeah. You know, people, yeah. You talk about the things you want, you know, the things that you want to get get where you want to be. Yeah. The sacrifice you have to make, you know, and sometimes people don't understand that. You know, like, why can't you do this with me? Why can't you hang out with me over there? Because you got somewhere you want to be. Right. And, and my parents sacrificed so much money for me to play summer ball. Mm. I, I still can't comprehend how much money they spent just for me to go play with my buddies every summer. That's and, parent love. That's yeah. anything they do for, 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 for their kids. You know, that's real. And it finally, and to see it finally pay off, I feel like it almost paid off a little bit more for them just to see that it was like their investment paid off. <laughs> you, you know, they couldn't stop crying. You, you, you know, that they, 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 they just could not kick, wipe the smile off their faces. No, they, it was a great day. It was a great day. I still remember it. It's... And now that we, now you, you we got the draft day, you know, you got drafted, you know where you're going. And you know, it's with, with, with the New York team of the Mets, you know, just that as a whole. Yeah. Now look, you from Georgia, you know, this is a, not up here, over here, we're a different breed. Right. So were you even prepared to be like, man, wait a minute, I don't know if I really want to head up over there and hang out with them. Right, you know, I, I honestly, I really, I had no idea that the Mets were going to draft me until draft day. A lot of other teams were talking to me and the Mets had no contact with me until draft day. And then once they drafted me and then you just see like I got to a lot of people were sh telling me like the history and I did research about, you know, just the um, the history of the New York Mets and being in New York and what it means to play in that city. And I'm going to be honest, it's pretty overwhelming to think about because mm -hmm. New Yorkers will let you know how they feel. They ain't afraid. And so I feel like it was. Um, it was kind of a lot, but then my first season, I went to Brooklyn and had to play in front of the Brooklyn fans. And I feel like that really gave me a taste of what playing in front of the New York crowd feels like. And I really enjoyed it. Speaking of Brooklyn, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because look here, there's some good stuff around Brooklyn. All right. So I want to know during that time you're playing over, over there, 
What were the fun sites you checked out? Especially, did you enjoy the Brooklyn food? Oh, I love the food. Love, love the food. I love, honestly, my favorite thing was hitting the little bodegas because, hey. oh, yeah, we don't have those here. We don't have the little corner stores right there where you can just walk to and get whatever you need. So that was really just an eye opener for me and something that I really enjoyed about New York. Um, we played on Coney Island. So I was there every day, walked around, saw the uh, the hot dog eating contest there. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I bet you. I bet you were like, man, y'all don't play around over here with this stuff. I was like, what is happening? I get off the train, I just see thousands of people <laughs> on the same street as our field. I was like, there's no way these people are coming to the game. And then I see um, Chestnut up there just crushing <laughs> hot dogs. So, no, I, I loved. Uh, I love Coney Island, and then of course I went to the city a ton. So, of course, I love it. And now, and now that you you are in the system, and now you and through now for the next two years, you were just going through. Again, I, I I think through your career kind of really ex- put, put, puts a good example of the person you are because of how it's been like an up and down kind of road for you, but it also it showed, you know, the things that you've dealt with with your life. So right. now in those two years that you've been in the system and you've been in the farm system, what have you learned from when you were in close to 27, 2017 and 2018? What did you learn about yourself during that time period? Um, So I came off my college season in 2017 where I struggled maybe one game. And so then when I get to Brooklyn, I struggled a little bit at the beginning and I didn't really, you know, you have those doubts like, is this really for me? But then the dudes around me and my parents, they really just kind of like talked me up and supported me and really let me know like I was there for a reason. And then that's when I started doing well again there. And then just knowing that I belong there is kind of what I've taken with me. So I take that, even if I have a stretch of bad games, I know that this is where I'm supposed to be. So I don't let it try to, you know, consume me. What did you learn about at least the minor leagues, the, the major league minor league that's different from college? Like what, what, did, what didn't you know before you got there? So everyone tells you that it's a grind and I didn't understand that until I was actually in it because I, I personally am a grinder. So that really didn't scare me, but in college, you're only playing 60, 65 games a season. So you practice the other days. In pro ball, there is no practice. You just play every day. Mm. And that's literally your practice. So I think that was something that I really had to get used to, like getting myself prepared every single day and getting in a routine so that I can be consistent. I think that was the hardest thing to kind of to kind of get with. How were you able to then to get get that routine down and to, to, for then for you to get comfortable in that. Oh, so you just, I just talked to the, the older guys on the team. There's always someone who's been there, done that. I just try to get with them, see what works for them, see what doesn't work for them. Try it. Doesn't work for me. Then I go to the next person. And I, you honestly, you just kind of form your own routine around what you see other people doing or what people have told you to do. So you kind of just form your own routine and the routine's always changing just a little bit, you know, like, You just have like a base routine so that every day, for the most part, you'll feel the same when you go out to play. And also, too, because I I know a few athletes don't talk about this too much, but I think it's it's an an honest thing to to bring up how you're away from home now. You know, now now you're completely you're basically a fish, you know, a fish out of of a small pond. You know, now you're in a big ocean. Right. you've, You've been just going from different parts of the farm. So. Did, did at any point you felt homesick? Every single season. Near the end of the season, you kind of, you feel like, I personally feel like, I felt like I was kind of missing out on some things, like all my friends being home from college for the summer, and I was in New York, and they're hanging out every day, and I'm seeing it on social media, Snapchats, this and that. I mean, you kind of, it feels like you're missing out on stuff, but at the end of the day, I've realized that, baseball is way more important to me than it is, you know, hanging out with my friends for a summer. So you definitely get homesick, but I guess I kind of also had a little bit of that feeling because in college I played in uh, Rhode Island mm-hmm. my freshman summer, and then I played in the Cape. So I was never really home for any stretch of time through my college career. So I think that kind of prepared me a little bit for being away from home for Pro Bowl. Did people understand, you know, those times when you couldn't be with them, with them during those days or were, or were they sometimes where people w- were ready to cut you off and they felt that you, that, uh, this ain't the same Tony I, I remembered back then? 
all my close friends and family, they, they know. So they, and they've had no problems with it. They know, like, they know I'm out there doing a job and there's a reason that I'm not hanging out with them or doing that. The only people who ever feel like that were just people who didn't actually care about me to start with. So, so they, so you're already like, look, y'all can kick rocks with no socks. Yeah. All right. Get out of my face. You yeah, couldn't care less. You continue to grow in your career. Something also happened, not just to you, but to everyone in 2020, after moving 2019 to 2020, the world is shut down. Yes. The, everything just completely shut. And with that sports for the first time in my lifetime, and I think all of our lifetimes completely just halted. And then we just seen the slow after effect affected everyone. So where were you the moment you heard the news that sports was going to be stopped? Um, so I was actually in spring training at this time. And um, there was like little whispers and rumors, like, I don't know with COVID what's going to happen, this and that. Um, and then one, like one day, they're just like, come to the field and meet out on the bleachers. They set us all down. They're like, hey, everything, baseball has stopped. Everything shut down. We're sending all you guys home. Um, and basically, we don't know when it's going to come back. So just go home and keep working out. But we don't have any answers for you. So that was the first time that I really felt it. How do you feel just, just hearing that saying you like, we have, we have no answers. So just stay ready. And so even when they said that I was very optimistic, I thought for sure, go home for two weeks and then we'll be back down here grinding again, ready to get the season started. So for probably the first two months, I was still optimistic that we were going to have a season. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, you know, halfway through where nobody's playing any sports, none of that. And none of the coaches have any answers. I'm not seeing anything on Twitter about anything coming back. The cases are on the rise. That's when I realized like, we're probably not going to play this year. And that was the first realization that like, yeah, everyone says the game can get taken away from you at any point in time. But this was the first time in my life that it really was taken away from me. And there was nothing I could do about it. What were your th thoughts? Because a lot of us were in our own thoughts during quarantine. What were you feeling through all this? It, it was kind of tough because growing up, for until 2020, I've been playing sports my whole life. So my, I was kind of building my life around how my sports were going. So if I had a good day on the field, I had a good day off the field, had a bad day on the field, had a bad day off the field. You know what I mean? Yeah. So not having that field presence anymore and just having to basically just <laughs> live with no sports was something that was really different for me. So it took a lot of, you know, mental skills training to kind of you know, be able to just be with my thoughts and be in the present moment. And if you think about that, you know, like that's a, a lot of people felt that way because you're like, you're so used, like you just said, you're just so used to a routine right. to when now you're like, what what am I supposed to do? Like, and then it, you're, you're just trying to find things to do just to keep yourself entertained exactly. and just to keep yourself busy. And especially too, as an, as an athlete, you're, just, you're, exactly. you're needed to keep your body in shape and to keep your, and just keep training every day. Mm -hmm. And that, and that was another hard part because I'd keep training and then, oh, seasons move back even more. I'm still training. And it's like, it got to the point where it was almost like, well, what am I training for? Because mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So that always like crept into my mind. So it took a lot of, you know, getting with our mental skills coach with the Mets and really like sitting down and talking about that, like at the end of the day, sports is going to come back eventually. And you want to be ready. I want to be ready for when it comes back. I want to be the best I can be. Did this pause make you even hungrier, like you just said, to play for the next co coming season to make you be like how much to appreciate your, your desire to continue your career? 100%. I'll never complain about a bus ride again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> the long Give me trip. all that. I don't even care. I'll take it. Seven days in a hotel room. <laughs> Put it on me. Let's go. I'm ready for it. And while you were at home watching all this, and then just seeing major league sports playing with no fans, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with just pictures of people around, how long did it take you to get, get just used to seeing like, man, no crowds. That's just a weird feeling. So it was in the Florida state league where I played in 2019, there was some fields, there was not that many fans. So it wasn't so unusual for me to see it, but to see like the big leaguers and then like strike someone out 
and then you hear just the dugout cheering, I think that is kind of what yeah. kind of took me back a little bit. You were like, man, yeah, this, this is 2020. My goodness gracious. Like that. I hope baseball doesn't say like this. That's why I kept talking. <laughs> Another thing that 2020 also did was kind of open a lot of eyes for people yes. because – during this time period, not only were we locked in our house quarantine and not be able to watch sports, we were also open to things that a lot of people may have been more shut up about or just blocked out. Right. So I would love to know your, what were your thoughts during the whole time during the Black Lives Matter movements and also to all the protests that were going on? What were you feeling through all this? I was feeling that it was about time that it happened because I feel like a lot of people, if you're not around, um, like depending on where you live or who you hang out with, you don't see some of the stuff that really happens in real life. And I feel like the protest and people speaking out on what's really happening and the truth kind of brought more light to a situation that for me, I live through every day, but some of my friends have never experienced in their life. It's easy to talk about it and say that, you know, this is a thing that I, I normally see or I I understand right. then there's people who, who look at you and they'll be like I don't get it and you, yeah. you, and the, you, you never will yep and they think it's not real and we're just making it up so I feel like this was definitely opened some eyes but there's definitely a lot more people that need to be touched so it definitely was a good um starting point I think to kind of move things in a direction that they need to go but we're just getting started Speaking of just getting started, because sports also and sports have always played connected with 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 just big political things going on in the world. Yeah. And just like that in baseball, baseball also was a part of this and how they were able to say, hey, look, either you're on this side or we just don't want to deal with you. Right. How, how are you feeling when you, you saw a lot of athletes just speaking up and saying, look, we're with this. We're with change. And we're not with people who don't want to see the world get better. It's really encouraging for me because I know since I've watched sports and watched people talk about sports, a lot of things that I kept hearing was you're getting paid millions of dollars to do this. We don't want to hear you talk about politics or anything that's going on in the world. All we really want you to do is entertain us. And I feel like finally, a lot of um, professional athletes are changing that narrative because they're humans too. And they can talk, speak about issues that other people will hear that if I spoke about it, maybe they wouldn't hear. So I feel like a lot of professional athletes are using that platform that they have now to speak about the injustices that are happening in America. Just because you're an athlete and you've been now blessed with a fortune, it doesn't mean that you're still not human. It doesn't mean that your problems still don't happen to you. Right. And just, just to bounce off back to you about that, how does it make you feel when some people look at you and they say that you shouldn't have any problems. You, oh, what racial injustice do you have at all? You are a professional athlete. Your life is fine. You know, it's it's tough to hear because even growing up, I grew up in a predominantly white area. So people already feel that. Like I've heard that before from people telling me that and being a professional athlete, you know, you have a couple dollars in your pocket and people just think that all of those problems just disappear for you. And it, honestly, it hurts to hear that people don't um, sympathize with the things that I go through every day. I mean, look, you're, let's not beat around the bush. You are an African American man playing in a sport that while it, while it's a very mixed race play of, of a sport that has a lot of Hispanic players, but also a lot of white players, yeah. the minimum is black people. Right. And it's a sport that not a lot of us are there. So, right. Do you feel that people look at you and they say, always say, why are you even trying to play in this sport that for some people, they believe that it doesn't love you back? You know, every single time someone asks me, uh, they see me like standing outside or at the gym or whatever. They ask me if I play basketball or football. Mm -hmm. That's the first two that they ask. Okay. And I feel like you don't really see if you're not in the baseball community, you don't see any black baseball superstars for the most part. And so Growing up, you see LeBron James, Michael Jordan, you know, and then you see the NFL players and you want to, it's just more exciting than baseball. So I feel like it is a, oh, it's a white man sport is what they call it just because the white man has dominated the sport right. because they didn't even want a lot of black people to be in the sport to begin with. 
and you really think about it, the big stars that represent our people in baseball, King Kirby Jr., mm-hmm. Jackie, mm-hmm. Barry Bonds at a time, you know, like w- w- even with all the stuff about them, you connected with them. We connected with Ken putting his hat in the side. Right. That, that represented us. Being a kid. You know, that's and that's the that's the thing right there. And how you go back with Jackie Robinson to what he did and the set, you know, for everything that he did just to play in the major league in this sport. Right into the future, you would hope that we would grow and we would evolve and get better. But then right. you hear stories from major league athletes, major athletes in baseball who say that in state, in other States, that it's rough. Like it's they rough, treat, yeah. they treat them hard. Even players who are on the team, yeah. they get treated hard. Yeah. It's, it's tough to know that I, and uh, thinking about Jackie Robinson, I don't know personally if I could have done what he did, Same. the strength and the courage and, everything that it took to do what he did every single day, getting death threats to his house, to his family every day. I don't know if I could have done that. So for him to do that was just an incredible thing for me because it allows me to play the game. And now seeing that even though times have definitely changed from when he played, that there's still that same kind of feeling about, about black players and baseball. It's, it's disheartening, honestly. What do you think? Just for yourself, what could baseball do to attract black kids growing up to be more into baseball? What could they do for any way to attract them to the sport? I think it starts with promoting the black players that are already the superstars in the league, the same way that, you know, Mike Trout and Trevor Bauer and Bellinger, the same way that they're just paraded around every advertisement on baseball having the having black players or someone that you know a young black man can look up and be like i look like him i could do that i think that's where it starts and then also just starting um starting like camps and things to get black players interested because even around here i feel like baseball has this outlook of being like a boring sport yes. because there's yeah. not a lot of action and people like to be you know thrilled and entertained and that happens way more often when you're playing basketball or football the baseball is more of like a mental sport so you have to understand it to really you know be thrilled watching the whole game and I feel like a lot of um, African-American men just don't want to just give energy to that to learn how to play how can I, how can I, I try my best to convince people that a perfect game just happened and then they come to me and say oh they just played a game of catch I, I, right. I don't know the big deal. Right. I'm, right. I'm like, it's a perfect game. You don't understand. That's amazing. Right. It's unbelievable. You know, so like exactly. Or, or you hear a, a starter struck out 20 guys in a game. And yeah. you think that's nearly impossible to happen on a daily basis. And right. they're like, okay, so these guys can't hit. I don't get it. I can't win. I can't, I can't win. Right. There's an appreciation when you know what's just, that appreciation is what makes the game as amazing as it is. You could only hope for change, you know, and I think that's what, in a way, what has happened in the world was, it was a way, it, you wish it didn't happen, but you right. also have little appreciation that it opened some eyes right. and it just got people thinking and want them to move forward in the future. And I think this is definitely a stepping stone that's needed for a better future in America. If y'all didn't know about this man now, I hope you know him now because this brother is going somewhere. I don't know where, but he's going somewhere. The big league, baby. So just speaking of that, now look, you're getting ready. You're getting ready for 2021. Mm-hmm. You know, big things are coming up for everybody. Pigeons catchers are about to report for yourselves. So just for yourself, what does Tony want for himself in the future? Right now I'm going into a spring training with a chip on my shoulder that this is the year that I'm going to make it to the big leagues. Um, and I'm going to manifest that. A lot of people on scan reports have looked at your numbers and some of them have actually started to push you aside. They're saying that you're too lopsided. You're, you're like a roller coaster. You going up and down, up and down. And they don't feel that you will progress to that to the scouts and the people who have said that you may be coming a bust. What are your what are your words to tell them that you don't know Tony? It's just I use it as motivation. Um, even 
in 2019 in Binghamton, New York. I got my last start. They booed me off the field. Every day I think about that and I just use it to motivate me. So this year I have a lot of people to prove wrong. What are also on your dream board, throwing the atmosphere of what you want to have before you you call it you call it a career? What do you hope to get besides making the big leagues? What do you want for yourself? I just want to be known, just be a household name once the end of my career is over. I just want to um, be consistent enough to stay in the big leagues for a good amount of time to where I don't have to really introduce myself anymore. What is your biggest fear for yourself? My biggest fear is not putting in enough work and then regretting it for the rest of my life, not succeeding at what I want to do. Imagine now you make your big league debut, right? Mm -hmm. Where would where would you want it to be? And any at any place mm -hmm. in in the games, whether it be in the home stadium or or away, where would you want it to be? And how would you want the moment to turn out for yourself? So number one place I'd want it to be at City Field in front of all those New York fans. Mm. You know what I mean? I feel like you can't really beat that atmosphere. You know, those fans, they're they're true fans. And if you sacrifice and do what you have to do for the city, they will repay you tenfold and they will love you for the rest of your life. So I'd really want it to be at City Field. Um, but if I had a second choice, I'd want it to be over at Truist Field in Atlanta, just so mm. you know, my family could come see me, all my friends, everyone I grew up with, um, even the kids from my high school that said I'd never make it, those people to be there too, mm. just to kind of, you know, kind of flex a little bit. But just with a shoulder out, be, be like, yeah. you know. we all think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Tony, in this time, we like to call this hour right here, the shout out time. Oh. Where, we get, where we give love and appreciation to exactly. those who have been by our side and kept us up when we yeah. couldn't move no forward. Oh, so sure. I'm about to throw you the rock. Yeah. I want you to go right now and give it all the love you can to those that, that means to you. Oh, go. I got a big shout out. My mom, Audrey DeBrell, my dad, Michael DeBrell, my sister, Adrian, uh, all my friends like Mikkel, Avery Ward, Adisa, Vanessa, Heather, Mario, Jorge, mm -hmm. just the true ones that have been around me uh, from the beginning. I got a lot of them. Antoine, I like to shout him out too. Just the true homies that, you know, never doubted me for one day. And they really just supported me through my whole baseball and my life. And last thing, if oh, you- sorry, I got, sorry, I got a couple more. Go, go nuts. I ain't gonna stop you. Yeah. Shout out uh, Coach Lemons from Chattahoochee High School. Shout out all my teachers at Chattahoochee High School who boosted me. Um, shout out Kennesaw State University alumni now. <laughs> shout them out. Shout out Coach Arminio, Kevin Arminio. He kind of made me in college, so he was a huge help. Shout out Coach Sansing. Shout out my boys, uh, Justin Motley, Terrence Norman, and LaDonis Bryant. You sure. And, and plenty more. <laughs> <laughs> And Tony, if you yeah. if you can go and look at young Tony, mm -hmm. the young man, the young boy who was coming up. And during his come up, he had no confidence in himself anymore, had a little bit of doubt when he wasn't drafted, feeling maybe this is not it for me. If you could, what would you say to him to keep him motivated? Just to trust the process. Um Every day you can go out there and get it just a little bit better. And eventually everything will start clicking and you'll be exactly where you want to be. Yeah. And last thing for all the young black kids coming up and they want to play this sport, but they feel that they don't, they don't belong. What can you tell them? This is a sport that black people were made to play. The athleticism that it takes to play baseball is something that every black child has and something that they can be. Um, this game will pay you back tenfold and it's really the most interesting and most mental game that I've ever been a part of. And I've easily fallen in love with it every single day that I've played. And you can do the same. And that is 100% real. My name is Ronald E. Smith. This right here is Tony DeBrell. And y'all, I think we just got real. Thank you very much. Like, share, subscribe. And I'll see you.